Hello again and welcome to Hype ITS stage. Our next speaker today is Tom Salfield, Salfield? Uh, the co-founder of OpenCoin, uh, which will be the topic of his presentation. Please welcome Tom on stage. Good afternoon, Campus Party. Um, my name is Tom Salfield, and um, as she said, I'm the co-founder of OpenCoin. Um, I'm a technologist with a background in economics as well. Um, and uh, so uh, OpenCoin is an open source digital cash system. Um, so uh, what I want to say today is that finance is changing. Uh, so the old world of finance is about, uh, is about banks and PayPal. Um, they, that they store and transfer money for us. Um, this is uh, like generally an expensive process, um, particularly the transferring of money across borders. Um, uh, there's a national monopoly on money creation, uh, specifically cash creation. In fact, there's a commercial cartel when it comes to um, when, it, when, it, when, it, when it comes to the creation of most of the money, so something like 97% of our money supply is created by banks when they lend money out. Um, it, we also have centralized stock markets, so uh, if you want to sell shares to people, uh, it's, uh, as a, as a, if you want to make a public offering of shares to people, um, that's often, uh, well, that's basically uh, problematic. Um, because the, the stock markets essentially have a monopoly on you being able to offer shares to people. Um, so a new world of finance, which I, I believe is emerging quite quickly, um, is one in which we have peer-to-peer uh, -peer protocols uh, for the storage and transfer of value. And we have internet-based currencies, such as uh, obviously the most successful one at the moment is Bitcoin, which is, which is um, relatively successful. Um, I think there's going to be a whole load more emerging over the next uh, years. And obviously, there's crowdfunding in terms of uh, crowdfunding. People are gradually rooting around the regulations, uh, which stop people from being able to make public offerings of shares. But my, coin, my, my, uh, my speech today is going to be focused on OpenCoin project, um, and p partly also on the other disruptive financial innovations which are occurring. And um, so specifically, I'm going to try and compare OpenCoin as a system with, uh, with Bitcoin um, and with a new system called Ripple. Um, which, which is very much uh, in the works. So um, we're, we're going to look at the functional properties of the systems as well as uh, the technical properties. I'm going to get reasonably technical, so um, I hope that's good for people here. I don't really know how technical people are. We'll see. Um, so OpenCoin is digital cash, uh, meaning that you can transfer it peer-to-peer -peer, um, and that it has the same property as cash in your pocket in that it's anonymous. Um, I can transfer uh, money from myself to someone else and uh, the, the bank has no way of tracing it or the issuer of that, that currency has no way of tracing it. Um, so, open source, uh, so the OpenCoin project uh, was an open source project. We started in 2007. Um, we, <clears throat> we produced a, a digital cash uh, protocol based on uh, Chaum's um, digital blinding system. Um, and a uh, reference implementation of that, uh, as well as um, we, we did a security audit with cryptographers from the Royal Holloway Information Security Department um, because we didn't trust our code to necessarily be secure um, against uh, the, the kinds of uh, mathematical cryptographic attacks without, without having real academics look at it. Um, we also did a legal report at the time. It's slightly out of date now um, since uh, uh, some of the electronic money provider regulations have changed since 2007. Um, so we would need to update that, uh, but it's done by a guy, a, a professor, George Walker from Queen Mary's, who has probably written more on international banking law, or rather UK banking law, um, than, uh, than anyone else. Um, so we're currently in startup mode. Um, we've realized that the, you know, uh, there's a potential to kind of take this to the next level. Um, and so we've got an international team of, of developers, cryptographers, we've got legal expertise, uh, we've got uh, most of our development team are, are based in, in Berlin, um, as well as the cryptographers. And then uh, we've got a, a business team uh, who are interested in taking it forward in Singapore. Um, so in, in our current economic system, money is created by banks. 
um, and it's also uh, also the main mechanism of transferring currency uh, happens uh, through bank transfers, um, which means that if something goes wrong with the investments that we have um, in terms because because when banks when you deposit money in banks it's getting lent out again so if something goes wrong with those deposits in banks as it did during the financial crisis part of the reason why we can't let large banks fail is because it, it also would mean that our whole uh, currency system would go down our whole sorry our whole uh, transaction system would go down the ability to transact is very much tied up with the creation of credit through investment so uh, that's one of the things we want to deal with. Um, the other thing, of course, is that uh, transactions uh, uh, in the banking system are always, um, uh, always account effectively movements uh, within a ledger. So that it's all based on records within, within a ledger, within an account-based system. Um, so international money transfers are expensive and slow currently. Um, and bank accounts aren't universally available, and banks have relatively poor internet integration. If you compare it with email, it's not really um, like sending an email currently being able to send cash. Um, so we have cash that lives in your pocket, um, and we can transfer it peer-to-peer, -peer, which is great. Um, however, if we want to uh, transfer it over long distances, that's obviously a risky thing. Not many of us send cash in the post. Um, and no internet integration at all. Um, so digital cash is trying to solve that problem through uh, minted electronic tokens and, uh, uh, and through um, effectively having the same properties of cash in your pocket by making it untraceable. The core of it's based on uh, the ideas of David Chaum from uh, 1970s, um, where he uh, modified uh, a protocol called RSA. How many people know what RSA is? Okay, about 60-70%. So um, I'm going to explain that very briefly. Uh, I'll, I'll go over it really quickly. Um, but the the David Chaum uh, patents um, expired. And, well, they were they were owned by Deutsche Bank after a time. Uh, there was a company called DigiCash in the late 90s, which I believe went bust. Um, and, and Deutsche Bank um, took over the patents. They expired in 2005, so in 2007 we decided it would be great if such a uh, currency was available for uh, such a system for, for transactions was available for um, the general population as an open source project. How does digital cash work? Basically, uh, we're going to talk about Alice and Bob, our fictional characters. Um, in, in simple terms, Alice gets coins from a mint, so Alice would go to the mint and uh, it, could be, it could be an electronic money provider, could be a bank, it could, it could be anyone who wants to issue some tokens. Um, you know, it could be an in-game currency, for example. Um, Alice can then transfer the coins to Bob, and Bob can go back to the bank and redeem them with the bank, either exchange, either, either redeem them for you know, essentially depositing them in the account, or alternatively, to get more anonymous uh, coins and be able to transfer those coins around. Um, so obviously with uh, um, electronic cash, uh, we have uh, the capability, electronic cash, these coins, they're literally just numbers. So there's every possibility of me copying it and giving it to two different people at the same time. Um, so it's really important that we have some kind of mechanism for checking whether that particular coin has been spent. Otherwise, there's no way of trusting it. So when Bob receives his coin, he's going to go back to the issuer and say, is this coin valid? Has it been spent before? So let's get into some of the technical detail. Um, so in very simple terms, as this isn't quite true, but um, in very simple terms, RSA is based on the idea that <clears throat> you take two prime numbers and multiply them together. Um, that makes you a public key. Um, and the two prime numbers themselves uh, are the private key. It's very difficult to go from the public key back to the private key. Um, and it's very easy to go, obviously, multiplying two numbers together to get to the public key. Um, I'm not going to go into more detail. There. So a standard RSA signature looks like this. You take uh, a message, and you raise it to the power of the private key. Technically, it seems like quite a technical audience, that would be the hash of a message, uh, not, the, uh, not just the whole message. So, um, Then, uh, then so anyone with the public key is able to authenticate that the thing was signed by someone with that private key. 
So the core innovation that Chaum came up with, and I think 1978, is that we can use a very special property of RSA, um, which is that you can. Uh, so if 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 I if rather than sending you the me the message text, so if I'm if I have a wallet and you have a uh, you're the issuer, I can create a um, a coin and I can multiply it by some secret number, which the bank or the issuer, the mint, doesn't know. So I multiply it by that thing, and then I send the, the obfuscated text, um, the, the number multiplied by the random number, to the mint. And the mint then will sign that as being worth a certain amount of money. Um, so they'll sign it with a key which says it's a £10 note, or it's a £5 note, it's a $20 note, doesn't matter. Um, so um, effectively, um, the mint then raises that blind coin, um, which, is, which is times by this random number, to a power of the private key, and then sends back the, uh, the uh, signed version. The cool part is you can now divide this blind signature by a secret, and by dividing it by a secret, we get a signature, and that signature is somehow valid for the original plain text of the coin. So what, what, what that means is we've now got a signature which is valid for the coin, even though the bank has never seen the serial number or the details of the coin itself. And that's the core of what OpenCoin really is. Um, so that's, in fact, what, the, what Charm came, came up with. And we've defined some open protocols on top of that, which just standardize the interactions between uh, the client and the server and, and exactly how to create a mint. So um, the first thing you need to do if you want to create a currency or a, um, some form of, uh, of mint um, is, is to create a master public private key pair. And then from that, you can create a, um, a currency description document which tells you what are the den denominations that are available um, and uh, what's the public master key so that people can authenticate that this is actually a currency signed by the particular issuer. Um, and then also they would create one mint key per denomination. Um, so just to go through that, I'll go through it quite quickly. Um, so Alice creates a payload with a serial number and a bunch of other things which are defined in our protocol, like de denominations, mint key IDs, and so on. Uh, then um, multiplies it by the secret. And then Alice uh, authenticates with the issuer, sends the blind to the issuer, and requests minting for the denomination. Um, so uh, then the issuer would then charge Alice's account, or it might be, uh, it might be that there's a payment made directly to an e-money provider, raise it to the power of the mint key, you get a blind signature, it sends it back to the wallet. The wallet, um, Alice's wallet, would then divide it by the random number, um, and uh, get the original uh, thing. And the coin is then made up of this, uh, sorry, so divided by the secret key. The coin's then made up of the payload and the signature. Um, so the bank hasn't yet seen the payload. Um, only now when it's spent, and Alice, uh, uh, Alice sends the coin to Bob, uh, then, um, it, so it can be, it can also then, sorry, the coin can then be tr transferred by any uh, form of uh, transportation, email, Jabber. Um, really doesn't matter. It's a question of what, what they find secure. Uh, we've set up um, basic wallets, which are, um, which are obviously connected via standard encryption, largely SSL um, connections between wallet, b wallet to wallet SSL connections and wallet to server connections. Um, Obviously, there's some issues with the security of SSL. But, um, so when Bob receives this coin, what Bob needs to do is renew it um, if he wants to use that coin again, because this coin will now be in the double spending database. So Bob has to go back to the issuer and get the uh, uh, and, and uh, send both the coin and a blind, his second blind, that, that second blind of the same denomination of the original amount. Uh, will then get returned back, um, but will then, will then get signed by the issuer um, and returned back to Bob as a new coin that he can now spend on. Uh, 
Uh, and of, of course, it's the same process of Bob receiving the coin and unblinding it again. So for the user, there's good privacy, um, just like cash in your pocket. Uh, uh, it's uh, cheap to transfer, it's immediate, it's actually instant to transfer as compared with other currencies like Bitcoin and so on, other transaction mechanisms like Bitcoin, and it's media agnostic and open source. Um, so alternative payment systems, which are obviously gaining adoption at the moment, are Bitcoin and Ripple. How many people know how Bitcoin works already? Wow, that's a lot. Um, maybe I shouldn't bother. <laughs> um, well, uh, so a few important points then about Bitcoin. One is there are no coins in Bitcoin. Bitcoin is a transaction ledger-based system. So um, the entire system is based on the idea of publicly publishing transactions, which, uh, yeah, which are then available to everyone. So every client and every mint in the Bitcoin system has access to every transaction which ever happened. So anyone who tries to tell you Bitcoin is anonymous is talking absolute nonsense. Um, in Bitcoin, yeah, your account, is, uh, your account number is a hash of your public key. Um, and you have a, pr a public-private key pair. Every transaction you, get, you will sign with that private key um, in, order to, uh, yeah, in order to show that you are the person that published the transaction as the spender. Um, history of, yeah, so you've got a full history of those transactions, and so, yeah, Alice signs that. Um, so, cryptographic hash function is used. It seems like everyone knows what this, this sort of thing is. Um, so, uh, transactions get flooded. We've got miners collecting the transactions into blocks, so all these transactions that get published in the network get collected by the miners. Um, and the miners check if the transactions are valid, i.e. is there enough funds according to all the previous history of uh, transactions in the network? Um, and is, are the signatures of these transactions valid? Um, they then create uh, a new block, which is all of the blocks of transactions which have been created, uh, all, the, all of the transactions which have been created, collected in this block, um, and a hash of the previous block, uh, also a payment to themselves of a certain amount of, of uh, bitcoins, um, which is where bitcoins get created by the system. Um, and a freely chosen number. And that freely chosen number uh, gets constantly changed by all the miners until they manage to find uh, a hash of that block which is less than a certain value. Um, so the um, first miner to find it basically wins and gets those, authenticates the transaction block, gets the bitcoins. X can be adjusted. This, uh, the value that, that uh, the block must be less than can be adjusted to be less than uh, uh, a certain value so that uh, we can achieve the 10 minute time window which Bitcoin aims for every transaction block, approximately. So the, the differences here, Bitcoin is a decentralized ledger, um, uh, whereas OpenCoin is actually a centralized minting system. Um, and uh, Bitcoin is public, um, whereas OpenCoin gives you peer-to-peer -peer anonymous transfer. Um, there's actually been a project to, uh, which doesn't seem to be live, but there's, there's a big problem with Bitcoin. With uh, Bitcoin, you know, you can obviously have an anonymous Bitcoin transaction um, if you set up your account uh, in an anonymous way, say using Tor. Um, but then the problem is how are you going to get money out um, without, you know, going through an exchange. If you go through an exchange, then at that point, you're going to lose your anonymity if you're, taking, if you're putting your money into your account. Um, so there's some people being interested in the idea of using OpenCoin as a, as, a, as a mechanism of doing that. I actually wonder if uh, the founder of Bitcoin, who's himself anonymous, would be interested in doing this since he apparently has about $120 million uh, worth of, uh, uh, of coins, uh, which he can't redeem, otherwise he's... Um, giving away his identity. <laughs> um, so in Bitcoin, there's one particular currency integrated. OpenCoin is really just an electronic token system. Um, and you can, th what those tokens mean is really just a question of what the issuer um, says, that, says that it means. It's a question of do you trust the issuer, uh, as in, uh, whether they're a bank, an electronic m money provider, or whatever. Um, so a few problems with Bitcoin. One is the size of the blockchain. Um, is growing and growing pretty fast. Um, and uh, this is with a relatively small amount of transactions. If you imagine the whole 
world's transactions were going through Bitcoin, we would have some kind of major problem there. Um, probably a bigger issue. I mean, there are ways of getting around that in the client. Uh, sorry, there are ways of getting around this problem in the client by only having a partial transaction log in the client. I don't believe that's possible in the Mint. Maybe someone can correct me on that uh, in the miner. Um, so mining consumes a lot of power. Uh, in April, apparently 31,000 uh, US homes was the equivalent to the Bitcoin's net, Bitcoin network's uh, consumption of power. And if we see here, it's gone up about eight, nine times since then. So we're looking at at least a major European city. Uh, it's quite significant, um, and I think that's a big problem. Um, transactions need about 30 minutes to be trusted because you can have splits in the network uh, where um, you know, if, there's a, if there's a net split, uh, it's possible that you've got one blockchain going on on this side, another blockchain going on on that side, and hopefully that's not going to go on for too long and one will win in the end. Um, but uh, it's uh, potentially a problem of trust there. Uh, or of knowing the authenticity of your transactions. Again, public ledger. Um, and this, by the way, this hash rate, I mean, this is a hash rate. It's a, uh, obviously only a, um, uh, an approximation of the amount of uh, energy used uh, as efficiency of computing increases. Presumably, it's going to be less than that, but this is pretty much looking exponential. Um, and... Uh, the operating margin of uh, miners is apparently now negative, uh, which seems to be a bit of a problem. Um, it, I believe that they're now beginning to bring in this idea of, uh, um, of actual transaction fees to the miners um, as a way of, of remedying this problem. I assume the reason miners are still running is because they've got a whole load of spare capacity. I don't know why else they would be running at a loss. As a currency, is Bitcoin well-structured? I don't think so. I think that uh, as a currency, it's, it's actually structured like a commodity. And so if the, if the total amount of trades happening in Bitcoin were to increase continually over time, because there's only ever going to be a fixed amount of Bitcoins, and we've already issued half of them, we're going to have a problem where, uh, I mean, it's, it's supposed to be designed as a deflationary currency. Um, so a currency which appreciates in value continually. A currency which appreciates in value continually, I would like to hold. I don't really want to trade those things, and that makes it not really a great currency. Now, if it doesn't grow and that demand doesn't happen, then we don't really have that problem. But, so the question is, will Bitcoin either remain niche or will it become a commodity that people just want to hold? So Ripple tries to solve a bunch of these problems. Um, Ripple is created by one of the founders of Mt. Gox, uh, one of the biggest Bitcoin exchanges, or the biggest Bitcoin exchange. Um, and um, it tries to solve the problem of not having to have miners in order to have a distributed transaction ledger. And the way they are trying to do that is by using trust. So each server has a uh, unique uh, node list of servers that they trust. And when a majority of those servers say, yes, uh, we trust specific transactions, so it's the same principle, the transactions get flooded out to the network. When a majority of those servers say, yes, uh, that's, uh, that's a valid transaction, then your uh, uh, server will also accept it. Um, so, um, and then publish to the other servers that trust you that fact. So the idea is over time you reach a distributed consensus. There's another concept going on within Ripple, which is, Another trust-based mechanism um, is a trust-based mechanism on the economic level, uh, whereby if Alice trusts Bob, Bob's IOUs, Bob trusts Carol's IOUs, then it's possible for Carol to pay, uh, yeah, for Carol to pay Alice effectively transitively through trading IOUs, um, which uh, I think is a really great concept. Um, they have, the, they have a business, uh, the, the guys behind Ripple uh, have a business model which is around them issuing the entirety of uh, a transaction currency within it. So there's this transaction currency which is used partly to uh, defend against denial of service attacks. 
um, and partly uh, as a, uh, 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 just a, a mechanism for paying for transactions to happen. Um, and they claim it will transfer in seconds. Um, however, unlike Bitcoin, where we have a paper which explains the cryptography from top to bottom um, in such a way that any of us could look at it and work out if it's for real or not, uh, these guys haven't released their server code and haven't released the proper white paper yet. I hope they will, um, because I really love what they're talking about doing, because I think Bitcoin, from an environmental perspective, is a disaster. Um, so, a little bit of confusion. Um, we founded OpenCoin in 2007, and it's based on opencoin.org. Um, the Ripple guys, uh, who've currently got some major funding um, from the US, uh, from major venture capital firms in San Francisco, have called their thing opencoin.com. Um, so, I don't really find their trademark very defensible, but uh, there you go. Um, so just to summarize again, yeah, OpenCoin uh, is uh, good privacy, cheap to P2P transfer, it's fast, i.e. instant, uh, it's media agnostic, you can transfer it over any media from Bluetooth to pigeon carriers, um, and uh, it's open source. We've done some uh, initial work on uh, prototypes uh, for the for user interface, they're very much uh, sort of uh, early and not production ready yet. Um, we, yeah, we would need to get some funding to kind of build those out in a way that's secure enough, essentially. Um, so yeah, OpenCoin use cases. One is obviously micropayment. Um, there's nothing stopping us having denominations of OpenCoin coins, which are like um, 0 0.01 pence. Um, so it would be possible to set up a system whereby, you know, uh, whenever you're watching um, movies, that, and you, if you hit the like button or whatever, then you're going to get um, like allocate a very small amount of money to that um, particular uh, particular piece of content. Um, you could use it for e email preventing spam. Um, so very small amounts of payment that which aren't going to affect. Uh, you know, so I, I can make it that you have to pay me to send an email, essentially. Um, and then a very, very small amount of, uh, um, of money, which isn't going to affect anyone who really wants to send an email, but would affect spammers in a very adverse way. Um, it's an alternative to bank accounts and for, and for international transfers. Um, I, don't think it's a, it's, it's a, I don't think it's a brilliant alternative to bank accounts. I think you'd want to use it in combination with a ledger-based system. Um, so that you could withdraw from, say, you know, if you had a Ripple ledger or a Bitcoin ledger, you'd want to withdraw from that ledger uh, your coins and then, and then use them in that way. I think there's also an interesting application uh, in the context of uh, monetary policy. So um, if we accept that at the moment uh, governments uh, only create 3% of, uh, of the money supply, A, they don't have control of that money supply, and B, if uh, they could create a really convenient mechanism for us to use actual cash to withdraw money from the, uh, uh, from the bank and, and so, so start using that as our transfer mechanism, they could issue a lot of these coins into existence, which might solve some of our debt problems right now. Um, remittance market is definitely a big opportunity, given that uh, we can uh, transfer mobile to mobile. Um, people over here trying to send money back to uh, the places they're from, um, and it's it, like, obviously in a lot of developed countries, there's an underdeveloped, uh, sorry, a lot of developing countries, there's a lot of underdeveloped financial infrastructure. Um, so uh, we'd have to have gateways on both sides uh, where you can redeem those coins, um, but I think it would take relatively little infrastructure and we could massively reduce the transaction costs. So as compared with something like PayPal, um, I believe our security cost is significantly less. They have to defend an entire server infrastructure, and if someone manages to compromise that, then they can change everything in the entire ledger. Um, whereas here, all we have to do is defend the uh, mint keys themselves, um, unless someone's going to break RSA, which, of course, is highly possible that the NSA already have done. Not a lot we can do about that. Um, so I think that's going to make it cheaper and it makes a business case for what we're talking about. Um, so yeah, to, to recap, uh, finance is changing. Uh, at the moment, we've got a system where 
the, our investment systems are linked to our transaction systems. That's very negative for, uh, for the resilience of our systems if there are crises in investment. Um, we've got these national and commercial monopolies on currency creation. Um, <clears throat> it would be great if we could have some kind of uh, alternatives to that. Uh, I think that um, there's a lot of potential for the future. There's a, I think it, like, all these different systems have a role to play um, and an ecosystem of alternatives that we can start building out new, um, new systems on top of would be brilliant and is emerging very quickly. Uh, so I'm Tom, and uh, thank you very much. Any questions? Yeah? Um, I want to ask if you have any of these uh, accounts that have their own currency. Ah, one sec. Do we have the microphone for the <laughs> questions? <laughs> if you don't mind repeating it. I want to ask if you've had any of the accounts who have their own currencies, like the Let's scheme. Right. Have they, because obviously they could issue their own cash and useless and it doesn't need to be tied to a currency if it's based on mutual exchange sure um, we have we haven't done that and it's something I'm sure we'd be very interested in doing yeah <laughs> <Anything else? laughs> hi having uh, personally lots of interest in these virtual currencies especially uh, lately like as it's been easier to mine um, com as compared to Bitcoin because of the ASIC miners. Um, I've, all ha I've always found it hard to actually get Bitcoins to buy them, to transfer them as to trade in currency. You know, you should be able to buy them a lot easier. And so, like, for example, one time, uh, Bit got, you know, the main trading site for Bitcoins was going to introduce Litecoins and it went up like 4% or something, you know, and it, it, there's quite a lot of investment just in the currency in itself, so surely the way forward would be to open it up as an open transaction system where you accept uh, uh, the currency and reward for the uh, coins. I'm struggling to hear properly, I'm afraid, I don't know why. Um, so, so Just so uh, basically, easily it's by the currency, so if you wanted to trade it for other currency, that it would be uh, better. With Bitcoins, there are surely Bitcoin exchanges where you can... Yeah, they're really hard to do because they're foreign banks, and it's not just like you, you get your debit card out and just swipe it and, you know, top it up like an Oyster card, you know. It's uh, far, far beyond that. Sure. So, so you just end up mining it eventually. Oh, you end up mining in order yeah, to get yeah. it because you can't buy yeah, it? Yeah, in order to get it. You know, <laughs> so that's what I did, anyway. Right. But, yeah, I don't um, know. Uh, is there a question? Uh, well, it's just, what do, you, do you intend on accepting money as a, as a proper exchange? Yeah, I mean, the, the whole concept with OpenCoin is that someone would... Um, uh, OpenCoins are only going to get created by an electronic money provider. I mean, if, they were, if we're talking about providing conventional currencies, it would only be uh, a bank or even a central bank, ideally, because um, I think they'd benefit a lot from it, um, uh, or yeah, or an electronic money provider. Um, so, of co yeah, absolutely. Um, that's that's the kind of use case we we hope to push forward. Are you worried about tax too? Sorry, that's my last question. Worried about tax? Yeah, they're they're, they're thinking about tax in America, etc., on virtual currencies. Uh, I, I, in this case, um, certainly, if you're representing conventional currencies, the tax implications would be exactly the same as using normal conventional currencies. Yeah, with alternative currencies, there's an interesting question about taxability. Um, and uh, I think, yeah, largely in the end, they are taxable on the same basis as trading in any other currency. Uh, enforcement might not be as simple. Yeah, thanks. thanks. Thanks for your answers. Oh, I just got to run. <laughs> Uh, I was going to ask long term um, how you propose uh, convincing governments and, and people like that uh, in the security of using these sorts of things because obviously at the moment bitcoins come under a lot of abuse uh, for sites on tour such as Silk Road, purchasing of narcotics, weapons, things like that and it's completely an uh, anonymous. Um, I know that was a concern of the UK government as, as far as making this a, a really usable thing. How, how would OpenCoin be any different? Uh, to Bitcoin in that respect, 
so maintaining the an anonym anonymity. Sorry. So we're certainly aiming to maintain an anonymity. I think uh, similarly um, to like tools like Tor, uh, we would make the claim that yes, people can use it for things that they shouldn't. Um, but that doesn't, that's not a, a good reason to not have that. Um, fundamentally, I think it's um, it's, it's a, a democratic, you know, in a, in a democratic society, um, we don't like the idea of the NSA monitoring monitoring all our com conversations, and we don't, or GCHQ in our case, um, and we don't really like the idea of of having every transaction not being able to do an anon anonymous transaction. Um, governments can misuse this stuff just the same as anyone else. However. I've spoken to people from the police about this project. Um, they came along to one of our conferences and I was kind of worried that they were coming to tell us that we're naughty. Um, and actually, what they wanted to say was they thought it was really good because identity fraud is one of the biggest uh, causes of crime in this country or one of the biggest enablers of crime in this country. And half of the problem there is when I, when I've got, um, uh, when I give them, when I go to my local gym and I give them my credit card, they're going to put uh, my credit card details and my address details in some access database, maybe, and um, they're essentially uh, compromising the security and making identity fraud much easier. Whereas if I were just paying them with an anonymous coin on a monthly basis, then identity fraud becomes much harder. So you're going down the route of saying, we're, although it can be used for other things, it will reduce other types of crime. I think, yeah, I think it's a strong argument for them. <laughs> um, I, what I thought one of the main issues with Bitcoin of people are just buying it to invest in yeah. and the idea is for a currency obviously needs it to flow yeah. are you intending to make any kind of ways of you being able to spend it on everyday products opposed to because at the moment you can't spend anything like you can't spend Bitcoin on much can you so what, how are you going to get it to flow around in a circle and why are people going to adopt like um, OpenCoin over Bitcoin when A, so much has been invested into it in the terms of miners, and also everyone's read about it, everyone's more versed into it for the people that are into that kind of thing. Yeah. What's going to convert them over or introduce new people that are probably not as into it sure. into Litecoin, if you get that? Sure. Um, for, for me, OpenCoin is essentially a system um, which allows us, you know, if, the, if, if a major bank came along and said, hey, we're going to start issuing OpenCoins, um, that isn't that isn't out of the question. So Bitcoin is a currency, and there's all all the. I mean, there is. A, I mean, to be to be clear about Bitcoin, I think it's a brilliant technical innovation for allowing distributed transactions, for not having a central server and being able to do that. Now, the Ripple guys are saying they can do it without all the crazy mining and so on. If they can, then brilliant. But we don't have any proof of that yet. Um, so. Um, and, uh, and theoretically, I see no reason why you couldn't use Bitcoin as a transfer mechanism. You know, you, like if you created a currency in, in Bitcoin, which was actually a, trans a transfer mechanism for other, uh, other currencies, I don't see why that's not possible. I think that's in many ways much more interesting than trying to create a currency which you gets issued at the point where someone uh, creates transactions within that currency. Um, or authenticates the transaction block, essentially. I mean, it's a bit of a recursive thing, isn't it? Um, whereas if you were to say uh, you can pay for transactions in pounds using bitcoins as the transaction currency, which is essentially what Ripple is saying they're trying to do, um, then I think you have uh, a currency on your hands that could potentially become you know, 2 to 3% of the global economy. Um, is that answering your question or not? Bitcoin is like it's just speculation. <laughs> why people are buying in it? How are you going to make Litecoin more stable? Because this isn't Litecoin. This is OpenCoin. No, Coin, OpenCoin. Yeah. Um, OpenCoin. How are you going to make OpenCoin more stable? Because Bitcoin's seen a massive variation right, in price. Right. So, so, so the Bitcoin, to the, the OpenCoin tokens are simply representing some currency. You could create a bit. Uh, you know, you could you could make Bitcoin open coins as as I said before as an anonymous way of transferring uh, currency out of the Bitcoin network. Um, uh, equally, you can create pounds, dollars, euros uh, as an electronic money provider. So we're not dealing with a situation like this is a piece of infrastructure for creating electronic tokens. This isn't a currency in itself. You could create some alternative currency in it, and I think that would be really interesting to do those kind of experiments. Um, I don't think we'd take the same approach as Bitcoin because, I mean, to me, um, the way I understand Bitcoin, it's got value essentially through novelty, um, through the fact that you can make 
transactions online without going through some governmental currency. So then people started accepting it, and you know, it's, it's now got value because people accept it, which is great. But is it, you know, could you do that again? I don't, I don't really know. Where is the value other than that people accept it? How, how does the value emerge? Um, you know, this kind of one of these crazy questions about currency valuation, right? I mean, it's all about what people believe. Um, so, so. <laughs> a bit of a follow-on from that. Um, in the current sort of finance debate, uh, the word centralized is almost becoming very taboo. Um, so your centralized, uh, I have sort of a two-part question. Your centralized minting yeah. uh, system, would it be more efficient if it was decentralized or is that merely, again, one of these buzzwords that's not really needed? Uh, the second part of that question is, do you believe that uh, the fastest way to introduce uh, the most efficient and effective cryptocurrency is through government reg regulation or total decentralization? Right. Um, so part one, uh, um, uh, it's a good question. It's too long. I, 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 yeah. Part one was? <laughs> Your centralized minting. Yep. Um, I suppose can that be decentralized, or is it defensible enough that it's not needed? Yeah. Or is it is it integral to the system? I'm just not. Exactly. Forgive my ignorance. Yeah. You know? No, no, no. Um, no, you're absolutely right. Um, so the way it's currently set up it, uh, and using the existing protocols, it's very much the process of issuing is centralized. There's nothing. There's nothing we can do about that within the existing cryptographic protocols. Um, I mean, you could create decentralized systems where you kind of have a shared private key, which is split across many servers. But um, I think it would be interesting to try and design a crypto system where, it's p where you can in some way regulate the amount that each mint would be able to issue. But the problem is if you just create more than one mint is there's no one who can actually regulate the money supply. Um, so it's still possible. I mean, the, 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 within the current banking system, you've got lots of different banks Issuing coins, but on a or issuing you know money on a uh, on a regulate on a regulated basis or semi-regulated anyway. Um, and uh, second part uh, is it the most efficient way to in introduce cryptocurrencies? I think um, I I, per I personally believe decentralized uh, is better um, in that I don't see an appetite uh, in government um, for introducing this kind of security. I'm um, libertarian, I can totally agree. Um, however, I think that the Bank of England is absolutely crazy not to see the opportunity here um, because they could pay back huge amounts of the debt um, and increase their control of money supply um, by issuing uh, some form of electronic currency uh, which, ele which effectively takes transactions away from bank transfers between banks. Does that make sense? No, it makes perfect. I think uh, some authorities in America have started to prosecute some uh, uh, traders in, in Bitcoin and some, some agencies there. Right, so um, Mt. Gox was recently attacked? Um, uh, not so much DDoS, but... Uh, no, no, I mean attacked by the government. Oh, sorry. okay, attacked by the government. <laughs> okay, yeah, sure. Um, so, yeah, Mt. Mt. Gox uh, was, was, was effectively, you know, they subpoenaed all the records and so on. Um, so, effectively, you know, making it clear that in that sense, uh, Bitcoin... It can never be anonymous so long as there's, uh, you know, a central well, some kind of exchange which can be, um, like yeah, where you can get the, the data from. Um, and I don't see a solution to that. I mean, obviously, government's going to resist against any sort of form of decentralization, unregulation, uh, or deregulation. Um, so, how how I mean, can we possibly go mm. about? Forming a because government's never going to go away completely. No. Um, smaller, I believe, is better, but many disagree. Yeah. Um, however, how can we become? How can we integrate and how can we form? Uh, you know, build build relationships whereby the government are very aware and are not fearful of what they don't understand. Yeah. And yet we can still cooperate uh, worldwide and create a global currency. Yeah. That you don't have the exchange rates, you don't have the fluctuations and in influence of. Of, uh, of, of you know, um, I mean, to a large it. extent, it's if you look at um, you know if, if if you if you look at it, a, lo a large part of it is that um, the sort of open source, uh, slightly anarchistic community isn't really into engaging with government. 
Um, so if you look at uh, the same, same case in France, um, the Bitcoin community went and engaged with the policymakers and the financial institutions, and now there are Bitcoin accounts in French banks. Um, and it, even I, as I understand it, the Fed um, in, uh, in the US have basically declared, or the SEC rather, uh, have declared uh, Bitcoin legal. And I think that's because it's decentralized and they can't attack it. You know, there's this thing called the Liberty Reserve, which was essentially an anonymous money transfer service. Um, they took those guys down, did them for treason. Um, it's kind of hard to take down uh, an anonymous creator of a decentralized currency. Or it's quite hard to take down a decentralized currency, which has got you know, huge amounts of computing power. So attractive, nevertheless. Um, yeah, um, there's a lot of the bitcoins and that sort of thing are based on um, cryptography that's been around for decades. Um, now, there's always a danger if it was publicly available that that was trackable or something like that, then the whole currency's become uh, yeah. worthless. How, how are you going to mitigate that sort of threat? I mean, uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, so, as you say, RSA has been around for a long time. There's no known, you know, this, in some ways, old cryptography is better cryptography because something like RSA, something like um, blind signatures have been um, studied, attacked by cryptanalysts over 20, 30 years, 30 years, I guess now. Um, and uh, people haven't managed to find, find the holes in those systems, um, although for example, uh, hashes, well, yeah, people finally, like, you know, MD5 is not secure because you can find collisions. As far as anyone knows, uh, SHA-256, there are no collisions that, that, that are, um, you know, you can't force a collision. Um, so, um, as far as RSA goes, I mean, uh, I don't know the state of, uh, of mathematics within the NSA. The NSA employs more mathematicians than the rest of the world put together. Um, so there's not a lot we can, you know, we can't know whether they've got quantum computers. If they've got a quantum computer, then the entirety of internet security is hacked, and that isn't just open coin or, uh, you know, every RSA key is cracked in parallel effectively. Um, and anything that's based on prime number uh, factorization is cracked. Um, or oh, prime number factorization? Doesn't really work, does it? Uh, multiples of prime numbers. <laughs> um, so... Yeah, uh, don't have the answer to that one. Post-quantum computing. Uh, there are post-quantum algorithms, uh, not widely used, not widely understood. Can't say I understand them myself yet. But very interesting. Thank you. Two questions, if I may. Uh, the first is, I understand that the method that Bitcoin uses to ensure that the volume of the currency doesn't increase sporadically is the, the mining method, that it ensures that the amount of Bitcoins increases in a fairly predictable manner. Is, is that correct, first of all? No, I don't think so. Is that? Okay, ignore that then. Um, second question is, uh, Bitcoin and other currencies were argued to be involved in the, the separate banking crisis by allowing people to circumvent the banking system by avoiding the banking levy that was in place, 40% on banking transactions, creating claims by various financial oversight people that society isn't quite ready for digital currencies yet, that there's some sort of social divide between how currencies are used, how they should be used, and how governments want them to be used. How does one reconcile these three to create a socially responsible currency which doesn't contribute to banking crises nor other ill effects? Are you saying Bitcoin somehow contributed to the banking crisis? The Cypriotic banking crisis. Oh, the Cypriotic. Specifically, right. the, the Cyprus bank created right. a 40% levy on banking transactions in order to avoid... Um, Sorry, in order to, to attack people. And people use Bitcoin to circumvent that levy, right. thus causing the banks to go deeper under. Yeah, uh, you create censorship, the internet will root around you. A exactly, that, that was more or less the <laughs> argument. But is there any way to enforce people to use an anonymous currency, but in a way that complies with how the government wants banks to work? Uh, only if the government uh, is up for creating anonymous currencies themselves. So they I definitely got to get involved. <laughs> I think they should. I think they'd be foolish not to. OK, thanks.
we done? <laughs> ah. I'm sorry, my question huh? is a lot simpler than the others. Okay. My, my first okay. question is who decides the monetary policy? And the second question is, um, you decided that you wanted your, the money to increase in value, while mainly, uh, I'm not speaking for, uh, I can speak for the whole, uh, for the whole world, but the, the currencies want to, to be stable, yep. so that inflation doesn't skyrocket. Why do you want to, to increase Bitcoin, in, uh, I'm sorry, open coin in value? Uh, so the question is, Would this currencies are deflationary? Uh, these currencies like Bitcoin and so on are deflationary, uh, deflationary currencies. The problem we have with our current system is they're inflationary. That's right? That's uh, no, 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 no. First, who decides the monetary policy for open coin? So, oh, uh, it, who, that, deci that, who, who decides? Whoever, whoever the issuer is. Yeah. Who decides how much money to print into into the um, into the system? Yeah. Let's call it the economic system. And who decides how much money to take out of the economic system? Because supply and demand gives the value of the coin. My question is, who decides that? Who's deciding that? Uh, whoever it, uh, controls this mint. So that it's not necessarily the entirety of the monetary policy of an economy or of a, even a currency that's happening within one mint. Um, you know, I might tomorrow say I'm an electronic money provider. Uh, you can give me uh, pounds and I'll give you open coins. And if you come back to me with open coins that I've signed, then I will give you back pounds. Um, that doesn't require monetary policy. Monetary policy only comes into play when we're talking about actual creation of currency as opposed to trans just a conduit for transferring currency. Um, so if, the, if, you know, if a central bank were to say the way we issue cash is using open coin, then this becomes a question. And, well, we'd expect that to be um, the central bank. If... Uh, we managed to build some kind of decentralized mint, then maybe we can do that on a democratic basis, which would be really interesting. Uh, so to answer the second question is, why do you choose to increase be, uh, open coin in value and not to make it stable so that the conversions uh, value uh, are, uh, are stable? We, we don't. Um, so with Bitcoin, the way Bitcoin is structured is deflation research it will such they will appreciate and I'm saying that's not a good way to structure a currency yeah because it will bubble and then burst um, it, if it keeps if it keep constantly rising without any control it might bubble and burst if the value is continually decreasing i.e. you have inflation then you will end up with a business cycle something like we have in the current system if you do what Bitcoin does, then essentially you end up with a commodity. So I think I'm agreeing with you. You want stable currencies. You want money supply that's equivalent to uh, the, to the Swiss the coin, maybe. Swiss coin is like Swiss this. Coin. Yeah, uh, I don't know. It's like uh, this. It, they try to keep uh, uh, trading values stable with uh, all the other currencies so that it keeps at uh, the same level. Okay, I'm not, I'm not aware of Swiss coin. It sounds interesting. Yeah. Sorry. No, no, please tell me. No, no, I, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, I just wanted to know why do you want it to rise and not to keep it safe? No, we don't. You don't. The answer. <laughs> Hello. Um, I'm just wondering how the um, foreign exchange element of it works because you're, what you're talking about is basically um, something you can, is, that is denominated in an existing national currency. So say, for example, I live in the UK and um, I, get, I also get paid in sterling, but I want to pay for things in euros. Do yeah. Can I, with my sterling currency, um, go onto, onto um, OpenCoin and buy euro-denominated um, uh, open coins and then use those open coins to pay for up, up things that I want to pay for in euros hmm. and how 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 do how is that more cost effective than the um, than the current structures whereby you get paid a large you have to pay a bank a large commission because obviously you're going to need a banking system um, you can't completely circumvent the banking system as it currently exists to do that and I mean, why why would the banks not seek to to regain the lost money in some other way by charging open coin? It's an interesting question. I mean, essentially, with open coin, you're looking at cash, anonymous cash. So uh, 
uh, theoretically, um, I mean, it would be another component of the system, another part of the ecosystem, but someone could actually create um, exchanges uh, where you can just do offers and offers and wants prices, you know, buys and sell prices, um, and then uh, you could exchange with no intermediary. Um, so you don't even have to have any transaction costs in such an exchange, although one doesn't yet exist. Does that make sense? We done? Thank you very much for your questions. Thanks, guys. And for your answers, Tom, <laughs> <laughs> as well as for the really informative presentation. Thank you. I think there may be more questions. Would you be happy to answer them? Yeah, I'm around if anyone wants yeah. to talk about any of the stuff, sure. Thank you. Yeah, I'll be over there. Great. <laughs> Thank you.